Okay, I want to begin with a quote by Reb Zalman. Uh, I think I've mentioned him a number of times before. Reb Zalman uh, and his work is really what um, Saging International is, is, is based on. Certainly there's more than that, but, but this is what Reb Zalman has to say about, um, about facing our mortality. He says, as we approach the subject of our mortality, let's be clear from the beginning. Death is not a cosmic mistake woven into the warp and the woof of existence. The presence of death deepens our appreciation of life. The more we embrace our mortality, not as an aberration of God and nature, but as an agent urging us on to life completion the more our anxiety transforms into feelings of awe, thanksgiving, and appreciation. People who face their mortality live out their days with greater zest and joy. By facing a subject that usually depresses and terrifies us, we feel lighter, freer, more perceptually and cognitively alive in all our encounters we are more aware of how precious life really is. As, as we grow older, it is almost inevitable that we find ourselves more aware of the nearerness of our death. Death may not always feel near, but it is at least nearer. Parker Palmer, who I've referred to a number of times, is, and is now in his mid-80s, says, and I'll, I'll paraphrase a little here, but he says, I don't know if death is right around the corner, but I can surely see it from where I now stand. And I certainly can identify with that. I'm convinced that this is one of the greatest reasons that we dread, fear, and fight growing older. We believe that it is when we are old that death comes and death is a bad thing. And so we often live in denial of something that is inevitable. We refuse to talk about it. We hope not to hear about it. We try not to think about it for as long as we possibly can. Many faith traditions, including our own, believe that our lives somehow continue or begin anew in some form of afterlife. And I have seen this be of great comfort to many people. But frankly, I've also seen it be a source of great suffering and fear, depending on one's own beliefs about the quality of their own life and the quantity of God's mercy and forgiveness. And no matter what one believes about what happens in the afterlife, it still happens after death. But the open and honest awareness of our own mortality, that a time will come when I am no longer here, can be one of the most positive and helpful blessings. There's an ancient practice called memento mori, that encourages us to live always with the awareness of our death before our eyes, not as a reason for sadness and grief, but as a way to remember and to celebrate the gift and the preciousness of each moment of our life. Some of us know from personal experience that a scrape with death can make our hearts beat not only faster, but also more insistently. Aware of life's limits and life's fragility, we truly mean it when with heartfelt gratitude we sing with the psalmist, this is the day the Lord has made, let us rejoice and be glad in it. Failure to keep the awareness of death and the preciousness of life before us can open us to later regret. Writer and former hospice nurse Bonnie Ware worked for years with patients who were in their last 
weeks of life. When questioned about any regrets they might have, five themes surfaced again and again with their patients, things they wish they had done differently. Try to share this as well. She wrote a book that's The Five Regrets. <clears throat> and here are the regrets that people frequently have. And this, I, I share this because uh, as my years as a chaplain, these, these are familiar. These are the kinds of themes that I hear. People saying, I wish I had had the courage to live a life truer to myself, not the life others expected of me. I wish I hadn't worked so hard. In my 20 years as chaplain, I've never heard one person say, I wish I'd spent more time at work. <laughs> I wish I'd had the courage to express my feelings. And that can be both positive feelings to tell people that they loved them, but also negative feelings to stand, or not negative, but necessarily strong feelings to, set, to stand up for themselves, to object. I wished I had stayed in touch with my family and friends. I have seen so many times and it is so painful to watch people trying to heal things at a last moment when it's too late. You can't, the person is not able to communicate. And I wish I had let myself simply be happier. The awareness of our own mortality can help us to avoid such regrets. And the sooner we start, the better. For although we cannot change what we did in the past, we can change what we do today and what we will do in the whatever future we still have, until we die, that is. Yes, death reminds us of the preciousness of our own life, of the lives of those we love, and of the time that we have together. The awareness that every day could be our or their last day urges us toward healing and reconciliation. It makes more urgent the need to ask for and to give forgiveness for we will not always have the chance. And it hopefully reminds us to express our love and gratitude, our awe and appreciation to others and to God. Death calls us toward life completion for every good story has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Every good book has a beginning, a middle, and an end. It is only at the end of the story that the full meaning is fully revealed. In the ancient Grecian myths, it was the life of the immortal gods that seemed trivial and shallow compared to the noble courage and chosen goodness of mere mortals as they fought and died for what they believed in, mortality makes our life complete. Yes, as Reb Zalman said, death is neither a mistake nor an aberration of God or nature. But even though we may be able to intellectually understand that, the, that it is, uh, that the fact that mortality makes life so precious, it is still precious. And so we, and we cannot clearly see what, if anything, lies beyond. And so we tend to cling to what we cannot hold. But if we can find a way to face and perhaps even embrace our own mortality, we can perhaps find a peace and a purpose for the rest of our journey. What I'd like to do now, um, and we'll begin with, and if you have something you can write or you, we'll take a little break so you can get that. But I'd like to spend just a little bit of time in your own personal reflection and just write a little with 
two, on two questions. And then after you've had time to do that, to reflect on it for a little while, maybe just we'll take maybe, uh, maybe 10 minutes for that. And then we'll come back and break into some breakout groups so that you can then discuss those, um, those questions. So let me share with you what the, the questions are. Okay, here are the two questions. And again, you can either write these down, take a picture of them, or <laughs> I'll, I'll leave them up here for right now. So when you're, when you're um, doing your little journal uh, exercise here, you can, these will still be up here. So here are the two questions. If you knew exactly when your life would end, how would this knowledge affect the way you live out your days? What would be different? What would become more important or maybe less important? So if you knew exactly when your life would end, how would, how would that affect things? And the second question, even though we don't know when our lives will end, what is one change that you can make to bring you closer to living the life you want today? Again, we're probably talking about small things, but what would be one thing that you could do today to uh, bring you closer to what you would want that remaining lifetime to be. Okay, is that clear with everyone? Okay, so we'll take about 10 minutes. If you wanna turn off your cameras and do it, whatever you wanna do, uh, make sure you're muted and I'll um, mute as well. Um, but we'll just leave those questions up there for 10 minutes and then we'll, we'll come back together. So. Just do your journaling and then we'll break into the breakout groups. Yeah, there's so many things that come up when we talk about mortality. Um, you know, one of them that, that I think uh, um, someone may have been Judith mentioning is, you know, there's another fear that sometimes is even greater than death. And that is the fear of being, um, having to have someone care for me not being able to take care of myself and that sort of thing, which is sort of that death before death. Uh, uh, um, one of my friends uh, at the retreat last week talking about um, dying before you die. Um, and that's a whole other area we won't be able to get into, but, but that's certainly, again, an equal kind of way that you might deal with it is, um, you know, well, what would I do and, and go ahead and do that now. But I want to talk about a little different part here that is, is also important. Um, another important part of facing our own mortality is to think about and make decisions about and plan for what we wish to have done or not have done at the time of our dying. And what we have done and what we would want to have done with our body after we have died, because those are things that somebody is going to have to deal with. Admittedly, these topics can be not only difficult to talk about, but for many of us, the choices are difficult to even understand what we're choosing when we do those things. Most of us these days have witnessed very few, if any, actual deaths. I was at, at that retreat last week. I, we broke into one group and they were... Um, there were six other people in addition to me in this group, and we're all in our in our seventies in, in this this subgroup. There were six people, and we were talking about death, and only one other person, other than me, had ever witnessed a single death, and that was one person witnessed one. And so our understanding of death is mostly what we see on TV, and I can tell you that it rarely happens the way it does on TV. On TV, dying people are aware, able to communicate, make decisions up until the last few seconds before they die. They have time to say goodbye, to say I love you, time for that beautiful and lovely soliloquy as they're on their way out, you've seen it. But in reality, except in cases of a sudden traumatic injury or sudden cardiac arrest, death is a process. And we usually lose the ability to communicate hours, if not days, before our actual last breath. And by then, others are making decisions for us, and often without any clear understanding of what we would want 
And far too often, these decisions are gut-wrenching for our loved ones to make and turn out to be not at all what we would have wanted if we were making those decisions. And so it is important both for ourselves and for those who may be making those decisions to ask, I mean, to, uh, to make those decisions ahead of time, to ask questions if we need to of our physicians or others, and then to document those decisions and discuss them. But even if, uh, even that's not enough, or far too often, even our documented decisions are ignored. And so we need to discuss our wishes with our family, with our loved ones, and choose a strong and trusted person to make the myriad of decisions that may need to be made when we no longer can. So I wanna just, just talk real briefly here. And, and you all may be very much aware of all of this and know all of this in and out, but I just wanna talk about this too, because this is also a gift that we can give. Um, you know, as we're looking in this, this time of our life, certainly we need to make sure that we have done a will, uh, you know, our, our, for our objects, our things, our stuff, um, making sure that all of those things are taken care of. And we may have one, but is it still current? You know, the last will that my wife and I did our children were much younger. And so, you know, we need to redo ours. And, and we talked about that recently. Uh, things change. So making sure that is, that is taken care of. There's another thing, you know, called the durable power of attorney, which is a power of attorney that allows someone to, um, to sign legal documents for you. Um, you know, you don't have to have that um, and turn that over to someone now, but you can set those up so that those, those powers spring, it's called a springing power of attorney, so that those powers spring forward at any point where you are determined and capable of making your own decisions. And I say these things because I, I, I've seen so often that, well, people will tell me when I go, one of my things that I would do as, as a chaplain, chaplains spend a lot of their time helping people do advanced directives, and so often people say, well, no, I'll, I'll, I don't need to do it now. I'll do it when I need it. And my response is always, no, you won't. Because <laughs> when you need it, you can't do it. Uh, and I have seen so many people trying their best to, to make something happen that it's just too late. You can't do it. Just as important as, as a, uh, perhaps even more important, is a health care power of attorney designating someone to make health care decisions for you and a backup person and making sure you've had conversations with those people about what you would want things to, to be. Um, now, if, if you don't have a health care power of attorney, that doesn't mean no one can make decisions, but there is a decision-making tree um, in North Carolina that if you can't, then your spouse would. Uh, if your spouse is not available, then it's adult children and parents, and, and that whole group is equal. Then it goes to brothers and sisters, and then, you know, it, so it kind of goes down. You may say, well, I want my spouse, so I don't really need one, but you and your spouse travel in cars together, uh, and those things go bump. So if the per first person is not available, who? Um, it also allows that person to be able to access um, health records if, if you needed them to get copies of health records and that sort of thing. So making sure you pick someone. And also we have to, when you're thinking about a healthcare power of attorney, make sure there's someone that, um, that knows you well, that knows what you want, that can do what you want and feel okay about it, that they're, you know, they're not going to be riddled with that. Uh, someone who has, is, is, strong in, in a healthcare setting. You know, I give sometimes as an example, my sister, she's strong and strong-willed and, you know, I, I trust her with anything. But when she gets in a healthcare setting, 
she is just totally like becomes this mouse. And I like, you know, she's just so timid and she won't ask questions and just, and I, you know, I love her, but I wouldn't want her to be my healthcare power of attorney. I want somebody who will ask questions and somebody who feels um, strong in making those decisions. So choosing that healthcare power of attorney, and that may need to change over time because the person you had at some point may no longer be the best choice. Uh, and same thing for your backup. There's also the living will, as you talked about, you know, and a living will is, doesn't have to do with property. Living will has to do with, are there some situations that if you were ever that bad off, that you would not want to be, your life to be prolonged um, with uh, life prolonging measures is what it says. You know, that could be a ventilator, that could be other things. It's different than that next thing, the DNR, the do not resuscitate. A living will doesn't mean never do it. It says, yes, do everything possible. But for example, if I were in a coma and they tried everything and I wasn't coming out of it, then take me off of that. Um, or if I'm dying and you're not going to be able to save me, then don't just prolong it. Let me go. Uh, and so you can look through it. And if you have questions, if you're doing a living will and have questions about what that means, you know, ask questions. And again, this may change over time. Another thing that's important to think about as we age, and a lot of people don't think about this, is at what point might we want what's called a DNR, a do not resuscitate order. You know, again, on TV, CPR always works. In reality, once we reach a certain age, and particularly if it is an unwitnessed event, it rarely works, or it rarely you come back to anything that is anywhere near what you were at. Um, and so a question becomes, at what point am I now in my life that, yeah, I want to live as long as I can, but if I get so sick that my heart stops or I stop breathing, the chances of them bringing me back to my vivacious self are so small that I, I, don't, I wouldn't want them to do that. Um, I, I even heard someone not so long ago who, uh, who was teaching a class on advanced directives and somebody said about something about a DNR. And she said, oh, a DNR is only when you're really, really, really sick and you're almost dying. Well, that's not the case. You know, again, I'm, I'm 72, I would seven, be 72 in October. Probably by the time I'm within the next five years or so, by the time I'm in my mid to late 70s, I'll have a DNR, not because I'm ready to, to go, but because in my late 70s, if I get so sick that my heart stops, the chances are not that great that I'm going to survive that. In fact, I've already told my family, if you find me down or I just don't wake up in the morning, don't let anyone start CPR on me. Now, if you see me go down, there's a chance you might bring me back. But, and so we have to just think through, and that may be something you talk with your physician about or um, someone else, but there are times when you might move from a living will to a DNR, even though you're not on death's door. Um, it's just at what point would you want to do that? There's another form of many people are not familiar with called a most form in North Carolina. It's that stands for medical orders for scope of treatment. You may, if you have a family member that's in a nursing home um, or maybe even with hospice, you, they may do a most form. And in that there's the first question has to do with, would you want CPR or not? But then it's questions like, would you want antibiotics or would you want uh you know, would you want to be, if you were, would you want to be taken to the hospital uh, to, you know, put you in ICU and on a vent and all that sort of thing? Or at this point in my life, would you just want to die at home? Or what would you want? There are all kinds of little questions that you can do in there. Um, and then finally, uh, thinking about and making plans about funeral and disposition of the body. Again, in my work, I've seen so many times that, you know, people don't want to talk about that and they assume that people know, or they've talked with their family, but over time changed their mind. I mean, I literally had two sisters one time, 20 minutes after their mother died, threatening to go to the car and get a gun and shoot each other <laughs> because mother had told one of them at one point in her life that when she died, she wanted to be cremated and her ashes spread 
at some lovely place she was like. At another time, she had told the other sister, when I die, I will be buried next to grandma. And both of them were determined to do what mama told them to do. But she had changed her mind. I'm not sure which one she came up with first or, or which one she wanted to at that time. But, but you know, the, the, it was not clear with her family. And so making those decisions and maybe making those arrangements. So, so those are gifts that we can give to folks is to think through those things. Because most of us, uh, or many people, I would say, um, when we, if you ask someone, how would you want to die? Most people talk about dying at home, dying peacefully with people that love them, around them, all those sorts of things. But very few people do because we don't give those instructions. And so we end up dying in an intensive care unit on a ventilator and somebody having to decide to take you off. And I know that's not how I want to go. And so again, that, that, that's, uh, again, a lot of information about topics that we don't like talking about, but I would, as we're facing our mortality, that is also an important part for us to look at. And so I wanted just to see, um, would anyone have any questions about any of, how any of those kind of things work uh, for just the, the little bit of time we have? This is by Cahill Gabron and it's called Fear. It is said that before entering the sea, a river trembles with fear. She looks back at the path she has traveled from the peaks of the mountains, the long winding road crossing forests and villages. And in front of her, she sees an ocean so vast that to enter there seems nothing more than to disappear forever. But there is no way. The river cannot go back. Nobody can go back. To go back is impossible in existence. The river needs to take the risk of entering the ocean because only then will fear disappear because that's where the river will know. It's not about disappearing into the ocean, but of becoming the ocean. Okay, next time we're going to be talking some about legacy. And, uh, and then we'll do a little wrap up at the end, but I've got a little piece of homework for you. And, and we are going to, we, if you've gotten the email yet from Elizabeth, uh, the, the, the time for the uh, date for the final uh, session has been moved forward one week. So it'll be the 22nd of May. Um, so you've got plenty of time for this little piece of homework. Uh, and it's an easy thing. What I want you to do is if everyone, and I'll get Elizabeth to send out the email to everyone else. I'd like for you at the next session to bring an object, a small object or some, some object that you, can, that you could show, that you could share, that someone gave to you that is very significant to you. But some little object that someone gave to you, maybe something someone left you or gave, gave you as a gift, that is very meaningful to you. And just be prepared to share just a, a few minutes, maybe three minutes most, uh, show, the, show the object and, and just tell why that's significant to you, who gave it to you and why that's significant, okay? And again, we'll send out an email to remind you uh, and to those folks who aren't uh, here tonight. And, uh, and we will see you on the 22nd. And Kate, thank you for your help tonight. Oh, thank you. All right.